Hello and warmly welcome to SCAS and to this seminar which is the first of this academic year and that will be held by Wendy Espeland. I am Christina Garsten, I'm professor of social anthropology and I recently started here as the new principal of SCAS. So I'm all the more excited to be here for this seminar to start off what I hope to be an academic year of uh, wonderful discussions and deliberations and constructive critical engagements. Uh, so Wendy Espeland uh, also recently joined us <laughs> as a fellow here at SCAS for the academic year 2018-19. Uh, she is a professor of sociology at the Northwestern University and she studies organizations, culture and law broadly. Uh, she has done a lot of research that is well known to us here in this part of the world uh, about rationality within cultural and political contexts. And perhaps most of all, her work on commensuration processes of translating qualities into quantities has been the part of her work that has reached the largest audience here. She investigates how, for example, media rankings have influenced higher education and how efforts to measure homosexuality have shaped gay and lesbian politics and the commensurative practices necessary in order to transform air pollution into a commodity that is traded on future markets. Those are some of the issues that she engages with. Uh, it would be too lengthy to go through all of her publications. She's a wildly published researcher and author, but I want to mention three of them. Uh, the most recent book uh, is called Engines of An Anxiety, how academic rankings uh, well, affect the uh, higher education institutions and the people engaged in it and also the departments more broadly. Uh, and um, another book of hers is Fear of Falling, how media rankings have changed legal education in America. Uh, the first one of these was published in 2016 with Michael Sauder, and the second one was published in 2015 also with Michael Sauder. She wrote a book in 1998 called The Struggle for Water, Politics, Rationality and Identity in the American Southwest. And that one was wildly celebrated and uh, also received the best book prize by the culture section of the American Sociological Association, the Rachel Carson Award from the Society for the Social Studies of Science, and the Lewis Brown Low Book Award from the National Academy of Public Administration. Uh, her publications overall have been highly recognized and awarded internationally. So I think with that uh, presentation, a brief one, I will just uh, give the word over to Wendy, who will talk today of the history of 10% measures of sexual behavior and the gay rights movement in the US. And her presentation will then be commented on uh, by Adrienne Serbum, who is professor of Sudeton University College, and who will sort of uh, invite us to discuss further. Thank you. Thank you for that generous introduction. Um, I'm just so happy to be here today. Uh, Christine and Bjorn and Pia and Sandra and lots of other staff have made it such a, a great experience. Um, so um, I hope someone will give me the high sign when I hit 45 minutes. I, I think I timed this, but we'll see. Sometimes I get excited, and if, when I get excited, I sometimes talk too fast, so if you can do this, I'll slow down but I can't promise I won't get excited. Um, so anyway, uh, two authors um, have been really influential in my thinking, and I just want to acknowledge them now. Uh, Stuart Michaels, who um, taught me what I know about sex measurement, uh, is a sociologist at the NORC, which is a survey research institute. Is that too close to the mic? 
Okay, okay. Um, the other person is, as Christine mentioned, is Mike Sauter, who helped write um, the book Engines of Anxiety. Christine, thank you for that really generous introduction, too, and you pretty much mentioned a lot of the things I thought I was going to have to, so thanks for taking care of that. Um, anyway, my work is about how numbers change things, how we think about things, how we define and express our values, how we do politics. And I hope that my research includes recovering and analyzing the power of different kinds of numbers in different institutional contexts, in politics, in markets, in policy, and in assessing value and status in various realms. Our lives are so saturated with numbers, where they're surrounded by them, that we sometimes forget um, how much work it takes to make them and how powerful they can be. Numbers are so useful because they simplify things. They allow us to represent complex kinds of information in ways that we imagine lots of people can understand. They make it really easy to compare things. They travel freely across geographical distances and cultural differences. We may not speak the same language, but we imagine that numbers are a way to communicate across all these differences. But numbers, however useful they are, can also be deeply transgressive, and that's actually part of their use. Um, they are, um, oh, I just realized that my, uh, my talk was only printed on every other uh, page. Oh, that means I'm missing half of it. Okay, let's see if we can do this. <laughs> I guess that was a new printer I used this morning. Okay. Um, anyway, numbers can be very transgressive. Um, they can subvert existing categories and make it um, very challenging to see things that aren't expressed very well in numbers. They can make certain things literally disappear. I'm going to give you a little bit of background now uh, about some features of numbers, not all numbers. As Christine suggested, I'm interested in commensuration, which is how uh, numbers are turned um, uh, how different qualities are turned into a quantity on, this, on the same metric. And what's interesting to me about that is that any way of expressing difference gets subsumed on the metric as an interval. So it's more or less, and that's the primary dimension that we notice with numbers. Um, the other thing is numbers, as I mentioned, are hugely important for how they or organize and simplify information. I certainly don't want to live in a world without numbers, and I suspect none of you do. Um, but we often forget how many resources it takes to produce credible numbers. Uh, they require real infrastructure. They require people who are disciplined about what are the categories that we're counting. They require rules for counting. Um, they also require categories that have boundaries so that we can recognize whether something is or isn't an instance of something. And that takes a lot of work, and that's work that becomes largely invisible after numbers go off into the world. Um, numbers are also interventions. They change us. They change how we see the world. They change how we understand our relations to other people. And they mediate identity, and that's something I'll be talking about more today. They impose a discipline on us when we use them as performance measures to assess how well we're doing or to make us efficient and rational. And we have, numbers are different from other kinds of information and other important symbolic dimensions because they come with attachments, long attachments to ideas about rationality and objectivity. And increasingly, we now associate them with accountability and transparency. So I hope one thing I'm going to do today is problematize a little bit um, how we think about the apparent transparency of numbers and also the kind of power that they can wield. Um, so, uh, a little background. I told some of you this already, but I'll be brief here. I started thinking about this stuff when I was working uh, on a decision about building a dam in Arizona. And the dam was going to force the relocation of a Native American tribe from their ancestral land. The tribe was called the Yavapai. There's Arizona, and there's the dam site at the confluence of two rivers. And it was the Dav Yavapai's misfortune to live right below the dam site. So if this dam had been built, they would have been forced to leave. Now, uh, and that's a picture from the reservation, which is incredibly beautiful. It's in the Sonoran Desert. 
It's one of my favorite spots, and those red mountains are considered sacred to the Avapai. So anyway, um, uh, one group inside this agency wanted to be fair and include the harsh impacts to the Yavapai, and they thought the best way of doing that was to create something like a cost-benefit analysis, where you weigh off all the benefits and all the costs, and the cost to the Yavapai would be really high, it would be really expensive. Um, but what they didn't understand, and what the Yavapai explained to them, was that you don't commensurate what's sacred that money or other land doesn't compensate for what you're going to take away from us. And that our capacity to be who we are depends on us being on this land. And how are you going to put that in a number? How are you going to express that as commensuration when what's fundamental about it is the nature of its incommensurability? Okay, so the Yavapai, shockingly, I think the first time in American history, they won. And another alternative site was picked, and they now celebrate the occasion of this uh, decision with a huge holiday every year that includes all kinds of fun things like rodeos and powwows. And so now part of a Yavapai identity includes protecting the sacred and being powerful and being able to talk back to numbers if that's what's required. So that got me thinking about um, how complicated and interesting quantification was. And then as Christine said, I did some work with Mike on um, the effects of university rankings. And we found that what was created by a really lousy magazine and was a really lousy measure that had no scientific credibility became this power, powerful force by which departments, universities, and people started assessing each other and their institutions. And this affected a lot of people in the US and it's also affected other places in the world. And just to give you a sense, this is just a tiny proportion of the kinds of rankings that have proliferated since the 1980s in the US. Some of these you may recognize. Um, I'm not gonna ask for a show of hands, but at some point tell me if your world is affected by these things, because I'm curious, but maybe a little bit later. Okay, raise your hands, go ahead. No. <laughs> how many of these, how many of you have to live with these things in a way that makes you Either it matters or it makes you crazy. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, so that's what I study. We can talk about that too. Um, but today, um, and the reason I'm at SCARS is because I'm writing a book and they agreed to support me in writing this book, for which I'll be grateful, I think, forever. Uh, and the book is going to be an investigation of four different innovations in quantification. I like to study innovations because that's when people are starting to make sense of something and you can follow the trail of the new invention a little bit and it gives you a sense of how it changes things and then you can look over time and see, oh, how did it become institutionalized or how did people forget about it? Anyway, the four cases I'm going to talk about are double entry bookkeeping, air pollution permits, um, visualization of numbers, new uh, techniques for showing how uh, quantitative data can be expressed, and then also the subject of today's talk, which is sexuality. And so to keep this from being the world's longest wind-up, I'll just give you some pictures. Um, double entry bookkeeping um, started in the, uh, we don't know exactly when, but mid-15th century. Uh, the first person who wrote about it was this guy named Kutrugli, and then the best known advocate was someone, um, Luca Pacioli, who was friends with Leonardo da Vinci, and he wrote the first treatise that was printed. The next thing is, um, how, how do we construct a market for something as intangible as air pollution? And the idea is, um, one set of, came from economists, I believe in the US, I could be wrong, about um, if we turn um, air pollution into something you have to pay for, it won't be an externality anymore, and it will be a way to get people who pollute to do less of it. Um, and so um, there's a, this is interesting because there's different ways you can commensurate and commodify air pollution. And so I want to look at how those work out in practice and all the layers of commensuration that are required to make this uh, into a commodity. Um, the other um, aspect I'm going to work on in this book is thinking about visualization. And I'm going to do a series of examples. Um, that have had a huge impact on different fields. This is one of the most famous images and figures in sociology. It's um, a path diagram that was first invented in 1962 that shows how father's uh, education and status affects the son's education and status. And it kind of launched a new field in sociology. So 
This is a picture that for anyone who has to take prelims or, or uh, general exams often shows up. Now this is a, an, an equally interesting example to me because it's based on the idea that you take a survey of people and you figure out what their preferences are and then you paint it. This is a painting designed by two Russian di dissidents, Komar and Malamud, and their idea was to use survey research to literally to have people tell you what their favorite features of, of paintings are and then have them paint that for different countries. So this is America's favorite painting, and they say this is an average of people's re survey responses. It's about the size of a refrigerator. It's got a lot of blue. It's got some famous looking people, but they can't be identified. It's got some animals. Uh, and uh, so anyway, that's, that's America's favorite painting. This is America's least favorite painting. It's about the size of a book. It's orange, it's abstract, um, but before you get too smug, um, they didn't do Sweden, but they did Denmark. And so you see a lot of blue, at least the Americans don't have a flag in their painting, if I could just say that. And that's the least favorite painting. So the idea is to interrogate this uh, uh, artistic expression that's so fundamentally thought of in terms of quantification. Another, um, I'm gonna also use a scientific, um, uh, a recent scientific graph or figure, and Steve has given me some ideas, but I'm also collecting them from people. Um, and I want to ask, in various styles of representation, what's pretty, what's persuasive, what's dramatic, and how do we get there? How do we understand it? So if you come up with a good example, your name could be here. <laughs> All right, now I'm going to get to the real part of the talk which is about how efforts to measure sexuality uh, shape the gay and lesbian rights movement in America. So um, the main argument is pretty straightforward, and I have half of it right here on a piece of paper. <laughs> My talk is about the relationship, this talk about numbers, politics, and identity, and the main point is social scientists played a crucial role in their efforts to measure sexual behavior with surveys and interviews, and that the modern gay rights movement in the United States is very much beholden to a particular set of numbers. Now, it's not the only thing that mattered, obviously, but uh, my argument, and my argument with Stuart, he's part of this, is that this played a pivotal moment in the early organizing and that then shaped politics thereafter for quite a while. Okay, so a nerd, note on terminology. I'm gonna be using a lot of different words to describe people, and that's simply so I won't be too anachronistic. So background, uh, background about, um, about sexual measurements and about gay history. John D'Amelio, who's a very important American historian, wrote, um, historian wrote a book about um, the homophile movement, which is what I'm gonna be describing for in a little bit. And his, I, he said, you know, during this period, it's hard to reconstruct what it was like to be gay in America during this period. But he said, basically, the predominant view of homoeroticism is that it's a sin, a sickness, a crime, and that most homosexuals saw their situation as a personal problem rather than as a political problem. And people were isolated, and they were invisible from each other. And replacing that view, which one in which homosexuals were understood as a distinctive community or an oppressed minority was a very long and hard process. And these emerging conceptions of homosexuality changed how people thought about themselves. It helped create a new kind of politics based on people's identities as homosexuals. And the authority of social science was mobilized and challenged by constituencies on all sides in their struggle for gay rights. The first important player in this was a man named Alfred Kinsey, who, um, although there were important precursors in sexual research, Kinsey was a really um, key figure. He was a surveyor, a zoologist, I'm sorry, turned survey researcher from Indiana. And his research on human sexuality fundamentally rocked the world and probably has had our biggest impact on thinking about sexuality, at least in the United States, since Freud. And it started when Kinsey was asked to teach a class on marriage and the family in the late 30s at the University of Indiana. 
and he was shocked at a how little research had been done on sexuality. Marriage in the family was a euphemism used to talk about such things as procreation and so forth. And he was shocked at how ignorant his students were and uh, how little sex research there was. And now Kinsey had been an obsessive collector of gull wasps. That was his animal. And he collected them from all over the world. And um, this ignorance on the part of his students and his teaching this class prompted him to switch from teaching about gull wasps to thinking about human beings. And his training in biology really shaped how he approached studying people. Uh, as this obsessive collector of these bugs that live mainly on oak trees, he was interested in how traits were distributed across populations. And he refers to himself as a student of variation. You know, how many different kinds of variations do we find in these bugs? And he sort of expressed that, you know, he took that idea and he applied it to people. He started interviewing people in 1938, and he was one of the world's greatest interviewers. If I could, if I could channel his skill, I would be thrilled. He collected 12,000 interviews, and he did 8,000 of them himself. It took me five years to get 200. He called his interviews sexual histories, and he could extract the longest sexual biography from someone in under two hours. Some of them were pretty short, but some of them were pretty long. And he was a strict behavioralist in the sense that he wanted to understand behavior, not meaning. So he took as his unit of analysis the orgasm, which he referred to as an outlet. And he wanted that to, that was his quantifiable objective measure. It was something that you could, someone could remember if it happened or not, or you could tell if it happened or not. As other people pointed out later, this works better for men than for women. But his analysis was based on figuring out what percentage of total outlet someone's sexual behavior over the course of their lifetime was explained by different kinds of sexual practice, one of which was homosexuality. So he had nine categories altogether of sexual practice that ranged from everything from masturbation to sex with animals. I'm not kidding. He was from Indiana. Uh, anyway, so he would examine which of these behaviors produced the outlet. So when he published his findings uh, with his colleagues, uh, there were two big fat volumes called together the Kinsey Report. The first one he published was about men, uh, and the book was about 800 pages of tables and statistics and the driest scientific prose you've ever read. It made you completely forget that you were reading about sex. And it was based on interviews with 5,000 white men. He'd done interviews with people of other races, but he didn't think that he had enough to uh, make his sample, uh, which was controversial later. The book became a publishing legend. There were six printings in 10 days. It was on the bestseller list for seven months. Within a month, he got letters from over 1,000 people and he said only six of them were from crackpots. Now that's the part I find hardest to believe. The book was stolen so often from libraries they couldn't keep it on the shelves. And before he died in 1955, it was translated into seven languages and it sold over a quarter million copies. Now I don't know about the books that you write, <laughs> but mine have never, <laughs> never received anywhere near that kind of attention. So here's some, so here's some pictures that are going to show you a little bit about his influence. So when his woman volume came out in 1952, he was on the cover of Time magazine. Now, what I love about this is you'll notice the birds and the bees. <laughs> Isn't that sweet? OK, you don't get it, all right. <laughs> uh, this is a picture of him giving a lecture at Berkeley in 1949. You'll notice there's a few people there. Um, uh, people had a field day. This was such a cultural moment, and people were so repressed that uh, comedians and, and, and journalists had a blast. So you could buy all kinds of photographs. There was a book of pictures of shocked responses to the Kinsey Report. Uh, they were all from women. Here's a cartoon that somebody wrote, and it says, did anyone here send for Dr. Kinsey? Um, there were all kinds of scams going on when people would call up and say, you're with the Kinsey Institute, could you tell me about your sex life? <laughs> and it took people for a little while to realize, you're not with the Kinsey Institute. <laughs> so anyway, this was a big kind of cultural thing. 
Um, and it, what was surprising to me, anyway, was that early on a lot of the response was positive. You know, given the times, you know, there was a lot of favorable coverage. Um, the harshest critics of Kinsey were the conservative religious and political leaders. And among academics, statisticians were quite critical of his sampling, his methodology. And anthropologists were really critical of his focus on behavior and ignoring the meaning of people's behavior. And of course, Freudian psychologists were deeply critical of his neglect of the subconscious. Uh, but what most people were skeptical about is how did you get people to talk about the intimate details of their sex life? And that's where he was, I think, quite extraordinary. So Kinsey's legacy is really hard to overstate in the US. It enveloped sex with the authority of science. It made it a legitimate topic of serious scientific research. It made it safe for ordinary people to talk about sex. And quantification played an important role by commensurating sexual practice with outlet or orgasm, providing the common denominator. Each kind of sex act is responsible for some precise proportion of outlet. And this, if you think about it, lends a kind of conceptual equality to sexual behavior, as well as reducing it to a neutral number. As the historian Paul Robinson, I'm sorry, Robinson wrote, the emphasis stripped sexual experience not only of its nuance, but also of its magic and its terror as well. It brought the most tabooed activities under the same conceptual roof as marital relations, what could be more boring, right? And in the process, rendered them innocuous. Kinsey's effect on homosexuals was also extraordinary. And although homosexuality wasn't his primary focus, it was one chapter out of nine, it, it still had a big effect. And one of the most interesting features of his analysis was his conceptualization of homosexuality. With his interest in variation, Kinsey rejected the idea that sexual behavior could be reduced into binary categories, that men could be divided, in his words, into goats and sheep. He saw someone's sexual history as made up of a whole combination of hetero and homosexual sex, of, of different kinds of practices. And as he put it, oh, I forgot to show you two slides. I'm not going to read it. I'm going to wait until they make it into a movie. Uh, one of the striking things about Kinsey's book was, like so many big books, it was more bought than read. But in case you're wondering, it was made into a movie in 2004 with Liam Neeson, I think, as a particularly handsome Kinsey. Anyway, here's what Kinsey says about homosexuality. It would encourage clearer thinking on these matters if persons were not characterized as heterosexual or homosexual, but as individuals who have a certain amount of heterosexual experience and a certain amount of homosexual experience. Instead of being using these terms as substantives, which stand for persons, or even as adjectives to describe people, they may be better used to describe the nature of the overt sexual relations or of the stipuli to which an individual erotically responds. You see what I mean by dry prose. OK. So Kinsey developed a new idea for how to think about this. And it's called the, uh, the homo heterosexual to homosexual scale. And this continuum is quite famous in sex research. So if you're strictly heterosexual, you're a 0. And if you're exclusively homosexual, you're a 6. And so his idea was to plot these different levels of variation on his numbers and see what came up with. Um, I should add that you can um, buy t-shirts at the Kinsey Institute, um, which houses a lot of the archives, um, that have any one of these numbers. And you know, I'm a, I'm a number six is the most popular t-shirt. <laughs> I bought one. Uh, OK, so some of Kinsey's findings. This is the number that got the most attention at first. 37% of overt sex, homosexual experience to the point of orgasm. 37% of men had had sex with another man that led to an orgasm. That was a number that really generated attention, more than one in three. Um, at least 18% uh, had as, at least as much homosexual as heterosexual sex. And I should add, old age is 55 for Kinsey, and adolescence is 16. And I just think that's a little ungenerous. 13% um, had more homosexual than heterosexual sex. 10% are more or less exclusively homosexual. They rate either 5 or 6 on that scale. 
for at least three years between 16 and 55. Now that's a pretty prescribed number, right? 4% are exclusively homosexual throughout their lives since adolescent. That's a pretty small number, and that's the source. So, what happens? Um, I got ahead of myself. Uh, so anyway, the 37% was this shockingly large number, number, and the idea that more than a third of men had had this experience was something that a lot of homosexuals of that period found encouraging, incredible. It was reassuring, it produced this visibility. They weren't alone. Such a big number made it harder to claim that such widespread behavior was perverse. And many biographies of gay men and lesbian women of this era talk about how important reading Kinsey or reading about Kinsey was for them. Now the great paradox of Kinsey's legacy is this. His biggest impact on our thinking about homosexuality is the idea that 10% of the population is homosexual. Out of all the numbers he provided, and I just gave you a small set of them, there are many more, what became taken for granted in the United States, what became an article of faith for a while, was that 10% of the population was gay. And this idea was a fundamental misinterpretation of Kinsey, who argued against a binary classification. So strictly speaking, for Kinsey, there were no homosexuals. Um, there were only homosexual acts. And he tried to measure people's behavior in a way that it excluded people's interpretations of it. Yet his numbers encouraged the development of a distinctive homosexual identity. Now I'm going to say more about how that happened. And this is a man that played an important role in that. Harry Hay. You could say it all started with Harry Hay. He was an important member of the development of this movement, of, uh, having, of, of the idea of having a homosexual identity. He was an actor, a musician, a communist organizer in Los Angeles, and an active participant in what we would now call the gay subculture. So in August 10, 1948, Harry Hay went to a party in LA with men of the persuasion, a term they sometimes used. And Kinsey's volume number one on men had just been published. And pretty soon, that's what everyone at the party was talking about. And the statistic they talked about that night was 37%, the number of men who'd ever had sex with another man. And for Hay, this 30% was a thrilling number. It meant there were millions of American men who had had homosexual relations. And that they constituted, in his words, and I quote, an organizable minority. Hay spent the evening trying to convince others that homosexuals should organize. And other people thought, that's crazy. That's crazy talk. It's too risky. There's too much hatred. There's all this prospect of entrapment. You could lose your job. Um, there are too many different kinds of homosexuals. We never get along. Hay was undeterred. He went home and he wrote two papers that night. And he stayed up all night to do it. I like that kind of energy. One was a plank for the Progressive Party. Um, supporting homosexual rights. The other first called was first called the androgynous minority, and it explained the basis of understanding homosexuals as a minority group and described a new organization dedicated to advancing their rights. Now, during this period within the communist organization, Hay was kicked out of it because he was gay. He applied communist theory on minority groups, this was a hot topic. How to conceptualize race in relationship to class. You know, minority groups in relationship to something other than their economic position. So Hay applied communist theory on minority groups to homosexuals. And the theory of the day held that there were four characteristics of minority groups that mattered. Shared language, territory, economy, and culture. And Harry Hay believed that homosexuals had two of the four, language and culture. And in his words, they clearly were a social minority. The original prospectus that Hay wrote doesn't survive, but the, one, the 1950 version does. And in it, Harry Hay used the 10% statistic twice. We, the androgens of the world, have formed this responsible corporate body to demonstrate by our efforts that our physiological and psychological handicaps are no deterrent in integrating 10% the world's population towards a constructive social progress of mankind. And then later on in the same document, we aim to provide a collective outlet for political, cultural, and social expression of some 10% of the world's population. Now, the handicapped language 
soon dropped out. And what Hay had meant by that was that people suffered a lot for being gay in those days, and so they needed an organization that could support and help them in their suffering. But they dropped that. And he first named this organization Bachelors for Wallace. Well, it took him two years to get the first member to join. That's how risky this was. And finally, by 1951, he had seven members, and they became the steering committee for this new organization. Uh, and many of those people had ties to the Communist Party. And they renamed the organization, instead of Bachelors for Wallace, the Mattachine Society. Uh, Mattachine is a, uh, is a name uh, that was um, acquired from French medieval troops of masked men who traveled from village to village performing ballads and dramas about social issues. At least that's what Hay believed. And the symbolism of the mask was very evocative for gay men of this period. Anyway, they needed a new name. Uh, the early members decided uh, they needed a new name to describe themselves, that homosexual was too stigmatizing and too clinical. So they came up with homophile in the Greek, which meant man, love, or friendship. And they used that to name their movement. The Mattachine Society was the first sustained homosexual rights movement in the United States. It was a secret organization that was fashioned after the Masons with multiple levels and the Communist Party with cells. And uh, no one knew all the people who were members. Um, that was considered really crucial for um, protection. And estimates of a new organization are hard to come by, but people think somewhere between 2,000 and 5,000 were members in 1952. Uh, Mattachine discussion groups quickly sprung up all over California, and then these groups were founded in other big cities like New York, Philadelphia, Washington, D.C., Chicago. And, to conceive of homosexualism as a minority group was a really radical idea in 1948. And the founding of the Mattachine Society was a really important political moment for people who had been invisible or pathologized or criminalized. And Kinsey's findings, we argue, helped Harry Hay make that move. It's hard to say why he used 10% instead of the bigger number, 37%. 10%, if you recall, was the number of men that were exclusively homosexual for three years. And we think this represents an intermediate position. Since Hay was trying to create and mobilize a new identity based on homosexuality, perhaps he thought that a more sustained experience was needed in order to get the commitment they needed. It was a very risky thing to do, so maybe men who just had sex once with another man weren't as committed as someone who had, had more experience with the stigma. Or maybe 10% was closer to the proportion of Negroes, the most visible minority group in the United States, and the explicit model for the homophile groups. Whatever Hay's reasons, inserting this figure, 10%, into the founding documents of the Mattachine Society helped this number circulate among homosexuals. In 1953, there was a split in the Mattachine Society. You know, no leftist organization can maintain itself for very long. So um, uh, Hay was forced out as a leader. There were people who thought he was too communist and it was too uh, radical and they wanted a more uh, mainstream group. Um, so anyway, it split and there was a new group uh, organization called One, which was founded and included more women and it included women. I should add that there was a woman's organization named the Daughters of Belitis, which was founded in San Francisco in 1955. And the woman who created that, Del Martin, Phyllis Lyons, and uh, Barbara Giddings said that this was independent. They had no knowledge of Mattachine when they formed this. So the lesbians had their own group. But both of those organizations and one started circulating these numbers of 10%. There's 10%. So Kinsey's statistics also helped spur a reaction. There were people who organized in favor of gay rights. There were people who organized against it as a, using Kinsey's numbers. And there was a purge of homosexuals in the federal government in the 1950s. Uh, increased prosecution of gay people in civil service at bars. This was the time of Joseph McCarthy and J. Edgar Hoover was head of the FBI. And um, there was a Senate investigation in, the in 1950 and the federal, uh, about the, a number of homosexuals that were employed in the federal government. And Kinsey's numbers showing how widespread this was 
um, was used in, in this report. And, it, and, and this pathology, as, as it came to be defined again, was broader and wide, more widespread than people thought. And the thing, like communists, homosexuals, you couldn't tell they were one by looking at them. So this kind of secretness about, oh, there's a lot of them out there among us, uh, was part of the impetus for this new crackdown. That gave rise to another uh, gay leader named Franklin Kameny who died uh, not too long ago. Uh, Kameny was someone, a very interesting man. He got his PhD in astronomy in uh, 1959, and he had worked for the Army in the MAPS um, service. And he, uh, he had served honorably in World War II, but he was fired in 1957 after he was entrapped by the police at a cruising park. He was investigated by the Civil Service Commission, and then he was subsequently barred from all employment with the federal government. And he lost his security clearance, which pretty much meant that what he was doing he couldn't even do as a, as a, in, a in a private job. This proved to be, not surprisingly, a formative experience and launched his career as a, a homosexual civil rights advocate. He filed a discrimination suit um, in 1951, it went all the way up to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court refused to hear it. But in his petition, he used the number 10% to show that there were 150,000 uh, uh, Americans, uh, based on the 10% of the census, that were um, uh, being discriminated against. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, 15 million homosexuals, not 150,000. I couldn't see my zeros. Um, and that there were 15 million homosexuals, and that, that was a huge minority that was being discriminated against. Uh, and so that number started to circulate in his petitions. But also, he founded a Mattachine Society in, in Washington, D.C. in 61, and this was one of the most active and militant organizations. He went on to found, help found another bunch of organizations. But in them, he used 10% as the estimate of how many homosexuals there were in the United States and in various groups. And he helped very much to popularize this number and take it outside of the homosexual community into sort of more um, sort of mainstream society. And the way that he did that, um, this, this guy had enormous courage. First of all, he sent a letter to President Kennedy in 1961 uh, announcing that he was going to find this, create this organization and saying there were 15 million Americans who were going to be um, uh, persecuted if they didn't, uh, you know, if they didn't pass protective legislation or if they didn't rescind the, 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 the executive order that barred employing um, homosexuals. Um, anyway, he got no response. I guess that's not surprising. Then uh, he also sent letters to every member of Congress announcing the formation of this new organization. So where everyone else was being really quiet and secret, he was like, I'm going right to the power. So he sent to every member of Congress um, you know, a, a, a letter that basically said the same thing. 15 million homosexuals were an organization that's going to you know, promote their rights. And then this letter is called the revulsion letter uh, in the archives. But what he writes back was, he says, uh, basically, don't contaminate my trash. My, my, uh, don't contaminate my mail with your trash. This is a conservative congressman. Uh, but that wasn't all he did. He also led pickets in front of the White House, in front of the State Department, in front of the Pentagon. And he organized them. And in every one of them, there was a sign or there was a pamphlet that said 15 million Americans are being discriminated against. So he takes the 10% and he extrapolates from that number to all these different groups, federal employees, the military, citizens, and so forth. And just to show there's a happy ending, uh, at the end of his life, um, Obama signed an executive order providing um, benefits to same gender partners in federal employment. And he gave a pen to Kameny. So. Uh, but that wasn't the only place where this number circulated. There was also other organizations that used it to start making claims about the power of um, the number of people uh, who could vote and who were being discriminated against. Um, so uh, let's see, here's, here's uh, uh, Julian Hodges, he's a, a, the president of an organization that was one of the umbrella groups. He says, let's learn a lesson from the Negro Civil Rights Movement. And what he's saying here 
is if, if the people that we know are gay, 10% of them voted for the other guy, we would have won. We would have beat this terrible um, opponent of gay rights. So he's kind of making the case in his speech that um, we could really have political muscle if we voted our interests and if we recognized those as being tied to our sexual preferences. Well, there were a lot of um, there was a lot of other kinds of movement um, in uh, in gay circles of this number. Uh, but then in 1969, there was kind of a big moment in gay history, and that's when there was the famous Stonewall riots in New York City where a bunch of patrons fought back against police harassment. There were all kinds of riots, and they formed a new organization called the Gay Liberation Movement, the Gay Liberation Front. And um, this led to another split in ways of thinking about how to secure gay rights. Uh, so for one group, the gay liberationists, their idea was, you know, the more radical, the better. Um, you, they saw all people as fundamentally bisexual, that it didn't matter how many people you had. What mattered was that, um, you, you know, you, you, liberation and transformation of society. Uh, but there was also a reformist movement, and this guy was part of that. And the reformist movement was using these numbers to press for political power, just like the Julian Hodges quote, to sort of kind of keep coming back and saying, look, there's a lot of us. We can punish you if you don't take us seriously. Um, so anyway, um, this is Bruce Fowler. He was uh, another important figure in the popularization of 10%. He was a biochemist, one of the early people doing work on AIDS research. He was also um, someone who named AIDS. It used to be called the gay immune d disease. Um, and um, anyway, uh, he, was, uh, he founded, helped to found an organization called the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force. And he remembers being dumbfounded by Kinsey's numbers. So he creates a new 10% estimate. And the way he did that was by averaging on Kinsey's scale, the fours, the fives, and the sixes. And he did that for men and women. And he came up with a new number, 10%. And this number of, was the number of predominantly homosexual people. And 10% was a really handy number, Voller argued. You just move the decimal point to see how many gay people there are in a population. And you can see how this shaped his political strategy. So here's what he says. We were invisible to each other, as invisible as we were to the public. We too needed to see the Kinsey Group's data made flesh. Ours was a new movement bent on uniting an invisible constituency on establishing itself is real. Notice the numbers are making us real. It had to create a self-image. We'd have to go through a period of exacerbating the traditional public myth, them or us, goats or sheep, of homosexual or heterosexual. We would simultaneously benefit from the Kinsey scale's evidence of our universal presence while ignoring it by insisting everyone was gay or heterosexual. So anyway, his organization used this number to launch a new campaign in the 80s and 90s that was very successful. And it was called, We Are Everywhere. 10% were everywhere. And so this showed up in political protests, it showed up in books, it showed up on just about every kind of media you can imagine, posters, bumper stickers, flags, so forth. Uh, and this is uh, Voller near the end of his life. He died of AIDS, and this is at a final protest with his children. It's a very poignant, uh, I think, photo. But anyway, um, so he was one of the members, and there were many other people involved, who used this number to get across the idea to lots of people that there are a lot of us. We're, there's 10% of us, and we're going to make that felt. Now. The thing was, this number started getting institutionalized, and I'm going to give you just some lists of organizations or programs that use it in their title, not even, not even looking further into their documentation. So you have gay rights organizations, you have virtual organizations, you have my favorite 10%, which is a gay shopping network in Toronto, and it was Channel 10. <laughs> Lambda 10 for queer students in fraternities and sororities. 
This is a picture of a, a newsletter by one of the gay student organizations, 10% define. The figure cited by Kinsey is the proportion of population that is wholly or predominantly ho homosexual. At UCLA, 3,000 students, 18,000 staff members are gay. Uh, 750,000 Los Angeles residents, 20 million Americans, 400 million human beings. So they're extending that number pretty far. Uh, in the media and the arts, this number starts showing up a lot. Newspapers, um, uh, newsletters, magazines. Okay, so you know it's starting to circulate. It's starting to name a lot of different kinds of things, organizations and programs. Uh, and so forth. 10% was also used to create something known as the gay market. In the late 80s and early 90s, um, marketing firms used 10% to calculate how many gay people were out there buying stuff. And so even though Kinsey's statistics were already 30 years old, gay-oriented firms like Overlooked Opinions in Chicago used 10% to gauge the income of gay people coming up with these huge numbers. They came up with $514 billion at that time, which was an eye-popping number. Outside of gay circles, 10% became a conventional, respectable uh, estimate of the prevalence of homosexuals. And the mainstream media started using it. As Vol um, Bruce Bowler put it, after years of educating those who inform the public and make its laws, the concept that 10% of the population is gay has become a generally accepted fact. But challengers also got involved with these numbers. And um, challenges to the 10%, I should say. The AIDS epidemic came in the early 80s and in the 90s. And at first, people thought it was a disease that only affected gay men. But there hadn't been any new Kinsey report, any new measures of sexual behavior. So for the first time, people realized it's really important for us to conduct these kinds of surveys now so that we can try to do something. Um, so what happened with these new surveys is they used different definitions of homosexuality. They had much better uh, sampling, better representational samples, and different interviewing techniques. But they came up with much smaller numbers. There was a Battelle study that found 1% of men between 20 and 29 were exclusively homosexual in the last 10 years. And in the media, this was reported as 1% gay. And there was a lot of new um, publicity about these lower numbers. So in the, in the Times, there was the shrinking 10% and homosexuals in the 10% fallacy in the Wall Street Journal. One of the best studies, which my co-author was involved in, uh, with the National Health and Social Life Survey directed by Edmund Lauman, um, produced the largest estimates of homosexuals. And I'm going to show you the comparison of that study with what Kinsey's numbers were. So for Kinsey, the number of men and women who'd had um, experience at least once, 37 to, um, to 13, who were exclusively since adolescence, 4 to 1 to 3. In the Lauman study, any homosexuality since puberty was 9% to 4, and exclusively same gender partners, 6 to 2, 0.6 to 0.2, and those that had a homosexual identity. So in this study, they used a more expansive definition of homosexuality, which they thought, everyone thought the numbers were going to be bigger. We'd had 30 years of gay rights, right? Um, so they talked about sexual practice, they talked about desire, and they also talked about identity. So three different ways of measuring. Uh, and they still got these low numbers. So the gay, uh, the gay leaders, of course, were highly skeptical of these numbers when they came out in the early 90s. Hank Donat, who was the editor of 10% magazine in San Francisco in 1993, said, we're not going to change our name. By their reasoning, there's only 2.5 million gay men in America. They must all be in California. Larry Kramer, who is director of ACT UP, said, Bill Clinton and Jesse Helms worry about 10% of the population. They don't worry about 1%. This is going to give Bill Clinton a chance to welch on his promises. Now, gay leaders criticized these surveys. They said, why would anyone be honest uh, with a stranger, given that their behavior is illegal in, in half the states? But they called these numbers low, ridiculous, and unbelievable. But pretty soon, they changed their message. So instead of focusing on the numbers, they started focusing on basic human rights. So the numbers shouldn't matter. If you're a human being, you should have these rights. It doesn't matter if you're 10% or 4% or 
So here's one response in the gay press. This is from the, um, the, the Washington Blade, which is a gay magazine. And basically what you can see there, the moral imperative to treat lesbians and gay men equitably is as compelling if we compri comprise one in 33 as if we comprise one in 10. So there's an example of how you kind of switch tactics. But the conservatives embraced these new low numbers, not surprisingly. Uh, Phyllis Shafley, who is an important uh, conservative woman leader, uh, said it shows politicians they don't need to be worried about 1% of the population. Many conservatives had never accepted Kinsey's numbers, or if they did, it was taken as example of the horrible um, cultural uh, decline in the United States. Um, but these new l numbers kind of reinvigorated their interest in debunking uh, Kinsey. And so the whole idea of normal now became problematized again. If it's not 37%, but only 1%, what does that mean? Um, so people started talking about in conservative circles of 10% as a lie, a myth, as propaganda, as part of a homosexual agenda, which was an important term um, that the moral majority, uh, Jerry Falwell's organization, an umbrella group of conservatives um, used. So I'm told I'm running out of time, so let me, let me stop pretty quickly. So anyway, um, so the backlash, uh, rejecting the notion that you are um, a uh, part of a minority group was part of the backlash. This was an amendment that was um, passed in Colorado that made it illegal to have protective legislation for gay rights. And part of the, um, the lobbying effort was showing that homosexuals really weren't a minority group like African Americans. So problematizing all that the idea that sort of went into the minority group. Uh, that's just one example. Let me cut to the conclusion then. Um, so efforts to measure homosexuality played an important role in shaping gay identity politics. Kinsey surprising statistics started a public debate that went on uh, pretty much ever since. And his numbers appropriated or misappropriated helped to galvanize a gay rights movement. Of course, there were people who understood themselves as homosexual and who organized their lives around that, but that, we argue, is different than understanding yourself as part of, as a minority group, as a political uh, group that has clout. Um, to picture oneself for the first time as a member of a huge minority group that could offer community and protection must have been really exhilarating, but it took a lot of work to do this. Um, so, these numbers helped to create in powerful symbolic boundaries for groups that sort of used them in different ways. And I think one of the interesting things this de demonstrates is that there wasn't just one 10%, there were four. And even though we take this number to be the same number and to sort of mean the same thing, for Kinsey it was just one of many numbers. It was a practice, not an identity. For Harry Hay, it was a number he selected and used for political purposes, probably very intentionally uh, selecting it. For Kameny, who said, hey, I'm the author of 10%, I'm the one who took it to the Supreme Court and all these other places, that was his number, and he used it to generate estimates of very specific kinds of populations that needed political interventions. And then, of course, Bruce Volner's number was a recalculation of Kinsey's numbers. Uh, one he saw as a useful distortion of practices. So what I want to end with is the idea that we should think seriously about the political power and opportunity associated with numbers um, and sort of what we do with them. And then uh, just one kind of uh, fun thing. Um, in an op-ed in the New York Times, on a Saturday the 13th, uh, Saturday, uh, in Saturday in um, March 13th, biologist David George Haskell talks about how sloppy it is to think about what's natural and how that gets evoked in debates all the time, and especially in debates about same-sex relationships. And he points out how blurred gender lines can be in nature and that the same gendered sex is prevalent in many animals. And he said, one in 10 mallards have homosexual sex. Now, I wonder where that number comes from. Thank you.